Yeah, welcome. Um, thanks for being here today um, and joining my talk. I'm, I'm Jonas, as Mike introduced. I work for Eclipse Source. We as a company are fully focused on building tools and IDE, so that's all we do, and we help our customers to do so. And when uh, we talk about building tools and IDEs um, in recent years, that actually means web-based tools and IDEs, because we had a kind of complete switch um, from desktop technologies to web technologies. And that happened over the last five or seven years, maybe. Um, and for that reason, I thought it's a good time to wrap that topic up a bit, uh, look back, what have we achieved, what have we accomplished in this area, and I would like to start my talk with three accomplishments that I find uh, notable. And then I would like to look in the future and mention some opportunities now that this topic has actually arrived, now that we really build web-based tools, what can we do better um, and also kind of give a vision from my point of view. Um, as Sonia mentioned, uh, what, what does the future bring? Um, so what, what can we do in the next five or seven years? And before I start with the accomplishments, I would like to mention two things as an introduction. Um, the first, you might have uh, seen a lot of talks about the topic of web-based tools in recent years. There have been keynotes and a lot of talks announcing this as the next big thing, like a trend that will come and everybody's interested in that and everybody will do that. I would claim this time is over. It has become a standard now. At least if we uh, look at the projects we participate and that we build, um, we have switched from doing maybe five years, 80% on the desktop, to now, as of today, uh, the tools we work on are at least 90% web-based. That's really, it has become a standard. It's not a trend anymore. It, it's really standard practice. Uh, all new projects that I'm involved in consider web-based tools as, as the standard. The second um, introduction slide to this topic is uh, good news. Um, the Eclipse uh, ecosystem is, is perfectly prepared for that. Um, for example, with Eclipse Thea, which uh, is the, I consider, next generation of the Eclipse tool platform. We have a great technology in the center that enables you to build modern um, and innovative tools based on web technologies. And there are many projects around there in the ecosystem. Um, when we started the topic, many things were missing like seven years ago, but today we have technologies for diagramming, for textual language, all implemented um, on a web-based technology stack. Uh, and all ready for you to use. So it's really up to you now to, to jump on board on, on, on this train in building web-based tools. All right, now, what have we accomplished in the last seven years? I had, like, I only have 20 minutes, so I had to, to reduce my thoughts, um, and I picked three accomplishments that I think are important. And I go from place three to one to make it more exciting. On place three, um, we are now cloud ready. What do I mean by that? If we build a tool based on web-based technologies, HTML, client-server architecture, and all this, we can actually deploy it in the cloud. And that means you can provide access to the tool via a browser to any user all around the globe at any time just by clicking a URL, you're there. That's a typical cloud vision, right? And you get all these advantages. I don't want to even go into detail, but these, has been, he've been, uh, these advantages have been mentioned a lot uh, when this trend was announced, like accessibility, collaboration, you host the tools in the cloud more efficiently in terms of resources and so on. You get all this, right? All these promises are there if you build on web-based uh, stack and you deploy your tools in the cloud. Now, maybe more interesting, why did I put this on place three and why, is there, why does it say cloud-ready and not cloud-based or cloud-deployed? Now, the interesting observation, at least in my personal context or in my work context, is that, as I mentioned, almost all new tools are, are created on a web-based technology stack, but less than 50% are actually already deployed in the cloud. Why does that make sense? And with technologies like Thea, you can actually build a tool uh, on a web-based stack with a client-server architecture and so on, but you can still deploy it as a desktop application using, for example, Electron. And that's a very common thing to do at the moment. Now, you might wonder, why should I do that? And um, it actually allows you to do this whole migration from a desktop application to the cloud a little bit step by step. First, you re-implement the necessary parts of your application, of your tool, based on the new technology stack, but you still 
have something that users can install. So you don't, you don't have to, for example, create a, a hosting. You don't need to worry about who pays for the hosting. Um, these changes actually require a lot more than just re-implementing a few lines of code. Many companies need to decide how to host, who does the hosting, we need organizational changes, we need infrastructure and, all, and, and, and so on. And now to not all do at the very same time this intermediate step to go on a web stack but still deploy a desktop application is actually very common. Still, the accomplishment is there because it's very easy from an implementation point of view to go from a web-based desktop application then finally to the cloud and then gain all the advantages that I had on the previous slide. Right, let's directly jump over to accomplishment on place two. I call that tool UX reset minus minus heart. Um, the developers in this room probably know what I mean by that. Um, but to explain that a bit. When you migrate a desktop-based tool to the web, uh, in the web you typically have an architecture with a front end and a back end, there are some things that you can actually reuse. For example, compilers, uh, linters, uh, business logic, everything that is headless that you can actually move to the back end and then run on the server. There are many things that you can reuse and that you should reuse in many cases. However, when talking about the front end, there's not much that you could, can typically reuse, right? It's, there's simply no migration path from something that is implemented in SWT or GEF to HTML, right? That, that, that doesn't make much sense. And that means in many projects, in almost all projects, the UI has to be recreated from scratch. Now, this creates efforts, obviously, but it also creates a huge opportunity because we can now use the very modern and powerful technology we have available in the browser that is, and that's, that's my claim, much more powerful that we have that, that, uh, compared to what we have on the desktop. Now, if we look at modern web-based IDEs, so for example, we have th Thea here, things like theming yeah, are standard. On the desktop, we have worked for, for almost a decade to enable a dark theme because it was really difficult to do. Other things like zooming, animation, all this stuff is already there, right? And also there are new ideas in terms of, of, of user experience to make it more simple, more keyboard focused, right? Really, really a modern UI. Now, why is this important and why should we care about this opportunity? There are actually lots of, lots of studies about this, but one is uh, very well known from done by McKinsey that says that better work environments for developers achieves a revenue growth grow four to five, five times more or greater than um, of, of other companies that don't worry so much about this topic. Um, and if you, if you only think about this, if you increase the, the performance or the efficiency of a developer by 2%, two per, two that's 10 minutes a day, that's one work week a year. Now do the math if you have 1,000 developers in your company. So this is really an important topic um, to care about uh, the developer experience. Um, and this is really, a, a trend at the moment and a very important topic and tools are typically not built uh, in a way that they're re-implemented every two or three years like some business applications tools are often there for a very long time for decades right eclipse eclipse exists uh, since over two decades now and i would claim that every generation of tool developers and i think there are many tool developers here in the room have only one chance to really do the ui from scratch yeah we have to do it if we want to go web-based, but let's use this as an opportunity and do it right. Um, involve UX people, um, think about the general design, reduce complexity, like Sonia mentioned. I think it's really a great, uh, great chance, a great opportunity. Coming to number one, and that's really by far for me the most important thing, at least in the current phase, um, and that's what I call building on mainstream technology. What do I mean by that? Um, Mainstream technology for me is the technology that most software developers use in their project and most software developers build business application, not tools. Tools have always been a niche because we don't need that many tools. Um, and um, by, uh, if we use the same technology stack than business application with tools, we actually build on mainstream again, right? And that's what's happening uh, today because web-based tools use HTML, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, CSS, React, and all these technologies that, that all developers know from, from creating business applications. Now, it, it's interesting, there has been actually a time 
when uh, in, in the Eclipse ecosystem, when tools and uh, business applications were built on the same stack, and that was around, or the time started around 2005, when RCP uh, came out and, and was promoted as a business application framework, and it was actually used by many, many applications down there. And we can see that if we, for example, look at a Google trend, uh, what I compare here is the number of search requests for manifest.mf. That's a typical search request if you do RCP development. Compared to package.json, that's a, a search request you do when you do Node.js development. And we can clearly see around 2004, 5, a lot of people uh, typically in doing uh, business applications were interested in that topic. And nowadays, business applications are not implemented on the desktop anymore, right? There are some exceptions, like control centers or something, but typical business applications are implemented in the browser or for the cloud or for the client server architecture. And that's why I claim there, there are just less people caring about these technologies, while web technologies are completely um, mainstream. Now, why do we want to build on mainstream technologies? Um, just to mention a few reasons, um, the more people uh, use technologies, the more contributors uh, are there, the more innovation happens, right? Ideas, communities are bigger. Um, the more people and adopter there are, the easier is the maintenance, because there are more players that potentially contribute, uh, for example, to bug fixes. Recruiting gets easier. If you, if you in our days, uh, try to get people from university, they know about JavaScript, uh, uh, HTML, and this stuff they hardly know how to program in SWT, right? This is something you would need to teach them. And openness, you can more easily integrate with other technologies out there if you're kind of on the same stack. So that's, for these reasons, I've placed this in, on number one in terms of accomplishments, because I think it's really a good thing that modern tools are based on the same stack compared to business applications. Now, let's jump over to three opportunities. So what do I see as things that we can achieve in the future? Where uh, can we, should we focus our innovation from my point of view? On place three, I've put collaboration. This was one of the big promises for, for cloud-based tools and web-based tools. Now, um, I would like to, to ask you a question. So um, what I mean with collaboration is that you can actually connect two IDEs and then look at the same code. Uh, you see the cursor of the other person. You can code together like you do in Google Docs, for example. Now, the question is who uses such a tool where you really collaborate uh, online in a remote way on an IDE on a daily basis? I see, I think, two hands, right? That's really surprising. Why is this not common practice? Because pair programming is very common, right? And this was really advertised as one of the core things that will come. I don't know the exact reason. I can just speculate. Um, so if we look what's currently supported is um, there are already tools where you can access the same IDE, for example, Microsoft's Live Share. And you, can, you actually have it a little bit like Google Doc, right? So you see the other cursor. You can change the same code and so on. But if I think about that and if I try that with Colic, from my point of view, what's missing is some sort of collaboration model, some guidance for the collaboration and a communication model. And the reason for that is I claim it's a different thing to code together compared to writing a text document together. Because in code, you have many different files. Things have to compile. It's just not the same, right? It's a different. It's, it's, I would claim it's more complex. Now, where can we learn or where can we look at to, to come up with this guidance um, on, and collaboration model? Now, when I thought about this, um, where did I personally collaborate with a lot of people on complex thing? I remembered when I was much younger, I was more, much more in computer games, and there was one game that I liked to play a lot called Allegiance, actually by, published by Microsoft. And this was a pretty complex game. Um, you were flying spaceship, you were building uh, mines and resources and so on, and there were like over 30 people per team. And it was focused a lot on collaboration. Like you had to fly in with certain spaceships at the right time, you could hide, uh, and, and uh, there was a lot of focus around communication and collaboration. If you got that right, you actually won the game. And uh, consequently, the game had great support for this. You could, uh, in the game, you could mark certain positions, tell people to go there, tell people to go there in five minutes, tell certain people to go there, and all this with just pressing keys, because back then there was no team speech. 
So we didn't talk to each other, we just were communicating using the features in the game. And I would claim that the collaboration model of this game and many other games is much more sophisticated than compared to what we have in our IDEs. Even if you look at games like Fortnite, games really have great collaboration models. That's, that's what they're really, really good at. So my idea or my, my challenge is look at what the game industry is doing. I think they're really good in developing uh, and enabling collaboration between people. That is even fun. And I think we can learn a lot there to, um, to improve that for our IDEs. And I think this is really a field of innovation and research for the upcoming years to, to get this right. On place two, uh, in terms of opportunities, I placed integration. Uh, that's a wide topic. Um, there are actually, from my point of view, th uh, three enablers that I mainly see here besides other. Um, that we now get with cloud and web-based IDEs. Number one is we can set up an environment just via a UL. So we could just send somebody to a UL and then they have a coding environment. Second, uh, the backend and the UI are deployed independently. Um, and to, uh, um, most important, the backend can run anywhere. It doesn't have to be on the, on the client machine anymore. And finally, very simple, the UI is now HTML-based, so we can integrate it with anything that is also HTML-based. Now, what would be examples for integration? The first two are, I would say, they're currently happening. Um, and that, uh, this would be about the idea, if you start on a specific task, um, I think a lot of efficiency is lost in, for developers in getting the context first, right? You have to open an IDE, you have to understand where to click, what command to run, how to test something, and so on. But if we can, create a setup and a running IDE just with a UL, I think we can integrate that better in our workflows. Uh, and the vision would be on any pull request, there should be just a UL. And if I click on that as a reviewer, I get a running IDE with the test cases focused where I know exactly, okay, this is what the, the person coded, this is how to test it, and this is the code that I need to review. Similar thing on the bug report, right? If, if I want to fix a, a, a bug report as a developer, there should be just a UL that gets, gets me to the exact same version that the bug occurred, maybe with some uh, analysis already done and so on. So uh, idea is really why UL uh, get, or, uh, get IDEs or IDE instances that already, are, uh, that already have the right context. This is happening, right? There are first tools that can actually do this, but it's not common yet, I would claim. To maybe look more in the future and, and mention more ideas about integration, um, let's think about a hardware vendor that sells you things that you can program for, like boards or chips. And they typically have an online shop where you can select the hardware. So now I, w I can configure and select my hardware. Typically, what I would need to do next is order the hardware, and they need to ship it to me. But why? Why can we not integrate the, uh, the browser IDE directly in the web shop and I just click, okay, this is the device I want to buy, and now I click on code and I can directly code for this device without leaving even the, the website. And maybe then I finish my program and then I say, okay, now I want 1,000 boards with exactly the software that I just developed already deployed. And then it's shipped to my place and I, I actually don't need to physically connect this to my machine anymore. And if I want to change or debug something, do I really need to install something on my machine again? Or maybe we just deploy the tool directly on the device, right? That's, that's possible. And there, there are examples for this. And I can just visit a URL in the same network and look at the device and debug the code in a live way. Was, was that a time warning? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm close to be done anyway. Number one uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, cloud native architecture. Now, when we uh, look at what we have done uh, or what's currently happening when des uh, migrating desktop tools to the cloud, I mentioned that there are some opportunities to reuse certain components on the back end. For example, compilers uh, and, and many other headless uh, uh, tools and frameworks. There are even web-based tools where full Eclipse instances are running in the backend, for example, for enabling uh, the Java language server. Now, this is great in terms of reuse, but it is not super great in terms of architecture. And when, 
When I look at that, it actually reminded me of a citation that Henry Ford uh, was supposed to say when, or said when he invented the car. And he said, when, when I would ask people whether they want faster horses or cars, they would answer faster horses. And the reason why this reminded me is what we actually did is we took a lot of the old components, and that's the horse here, and we've put it in a new container, right? This car. It's faster, it's running in the cloud, but internally in the business logic and the back end, we haven't changed much. What we change is the front end though. Now, why is this bad? Um, if we look at uh, the containers and the environments we have to host for tool backends, they consume a lot of resources, really a lot. Like a standard tool easily eats up to 500 MB of m uh, memory or even one gigabyte or two gigabyte per user. Per user. Now, if we, and, and we have actually observed this in practice, if we go to the cloud department of uh, existing companies and they are not familiar with what cloud tools do, they live in this world where they have microservices that, are, that they can scale, that are very small with a very low fo fo footprint, very s uh, fast startup times, they can, um, they can start and stop them anytime. And if you tell them, okay, this is now the tool backend for our users that we want to host, it feels for them like this, right? It's a huge, gigantic thing. I cannot just stop it, and I need one container per user. So if we have 10,000 users, I need 10,000 of these things. It's a nightmare for them, right? It's completely not what they are used to. And I think we need to change that. And I think that's an opportunity for in, in this field. Now, how can we change that? Um, I could simply talk for one day about this topic because there are many, many ideas, but I just want to mention two of them. Number one, um, almost all tools have a front end and a back end. And the, the reason for the back end is often that we want to use technologies that do not run in the browser. But now, especially in the Eclipse ecosystem, many of the newer technologies, for example, like Langium or Eclipse GLSP, they're fully uh, written in TypeScript and they, are, they now support to run in the browser. Now, depending on the tool you have, we can actually, in certain scenarios, get rid of the backend. We are currently in, in the Thea project, we are working on a version of Thea that runs without a backend that is just a static website. We can use a browser-based file system to, um, to store the files that the user wants to work on. For example, uh, you can clone them directly from a Git repository into the browser-based file system and then completely work without a backend, right? That re reduces the, the, the overhead for this backend like to zero because we don't need it anymore. We just need to host the website. The other direction that I find very interesting is to go more towards a cloud native architecture. And that actually means reduce the size of these things, do less in the back end, move stuff to the front end when we can, but also work with shared services. For example, if we think about 1,000 developers working on the same code base, um, the difference between the different developers in, in terms of code, what they change is probably 0.001%, but they all compile the full code base every day, probably 50 times or more, right? That is a lot of waste of uh, resources, memory, and so on. Why don't we build a shared index, right? A shared uh, a w a compiler that can somehow only recompile and, and share the results with all the developers. Of course, that requires changing the existing architecture. It requires effort. But I think something, this is something with a lot of opportunity, but also necessity uh, for the future to, uh, now that we are really going to the cloud that we also use the architecture uh, that is common in the cloud and not just put the elephant there. All right, um, and th with that, I would like to close. I have one bonus opportunity, um, and that's open source collaboration. What I really feel in recent years is that the whole web-based tools area um, has a, a really great open source collaboration style. So a lot of things are happening inside and outside of the Eclipse ecosystem. Companies are very open in terms of collaboration and sharing efforts, and we, we're really proud to be a part of that. So my takeaway for, for you today, if you're in the area of tool or framework development, is join this vibrant uh, community. Be part um, of this 
I would claim, unique opportunity to shape the future of IDEs and tools. We will not change, uh, I don't expect that we will change the architecture of our tools for the next one or two decades again. So this is really now the time where you can influence things, um, create innovation and really shape the future of, um, of our domain. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me and enjoy EclipseCon. <laughs>